Hi, everyone. Hello. We are working through Genesis chapter 2. We're at verses 15 to 17. We've already mentioned that this section of, of Genesis is usually called the Covenant of Creation or the Eden Covenant. There's only a single prohibition involved in this covenant. It's mm -hmm. bilateral, but there's only one prohibition. So let's read about that in these three verses, Genesis 2, 15 to 17 in the NIV. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. You must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, for a lot of people who are unbelievers, generally, uh, this is a trivial prohibition to put on a perfect man and woman, if you want to look mm -hmm. at them that way. That's the way we were trained to look at them, as perfect creatures. They're being tested by a prohibition that looks to many people as trivial and if God is going to expel people from paradise, surely it for, should be for a more important reason than this. Mm -hmm. But, of course, that overlooks certain New Testament principles, or even Old Testament, but the ones I'm thinking of are in Luke, where Christ himself says, He who is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Mm -hmm. And also James, who says, If you break one commandment of God, you've broken the whole law. Since it's such an undemanding prohibition too it's not like they would be in want if they didn't have from that tree yeah uh, you you know this this kind of breaks down that as being a point I think if it's if it's such a trivial thing why weren't why didn't they keep it <laughs> you know and, and I I think if we were to look at our own lives if you're raising children if your child disobeys you say you say no cookies before dinner and they go and take one before dinner it's not the cookie that you're worried about it's the fact that they've disobeyed you yeah. and if they've lied to you or been dishonest it doesn't matter what they've lied about your concern is that they're lying they don't have trust in you mm -hmm. they, they're breaking uh, the goodness of your relationship you train children with these little tests. Yeah, so that they're prepared for bigger tests as they get older. Yeah. Why should God be any different with his people? I think it's character training. Yeah. Henry, or Henri Blochet, I think that's how you pronounce his name, and then a very nice book called In the Beginning takes this up, and uh, we'll read that quote first, and then I'll read some Calvin. Knowledge of good and evil corresponds to the ability to decide. It is the prerogative of the king who judges his subjects and of the father who brings up his son. What analysis could be more suitable for Genesis? It shows the man as the vassal of the Lord by virtue of his covenant of grace. It makes him as if as it were, a son of the Creator, God. The Lord reserves for himself the royal prerogative to decide. The Creator, God alone, knows good and evil. He alone is autonomous. Yeah, he is by right the only lawgiver. Mm -hmm. Now Calvin adds to that, we must also see what is the cause of death, namely alienation from God. And this goes to our definition of death, which we'll get to in a minute. If we're witnesses, we define death as the cessation of physical existence. Yeah, so Calvin, then we, we think it's just a, a winding down of life in Adam. Yeah, Calvin does not have that opinion, neither does the consensus of Christian tradition. Calvin goes on, thence it follows that under the name of death is comprehended all these miseries in which Adam involved himself by his defection. For as soon as he revolted from God, the fountain of life, he was cast down from his former state, in order that he might perceive the life of man without God to be wretched and lost, and therefore differing nothing from death. Hence the condition of man after his sin is not improperly, pr improperly called both the privation of life and death. 
the miseries of, and evils, both of soul and body, with which man is beset, so long as he's on earth, are a kind of entrance into death, till death itself entirely absorbs him. For the scripture everywhere calls those dead, who, being oppressed by the tyranny of sin and Satan, breathe nothing but their own destruction. Wherefore, the question is superfluous how it was that God threatened death to Adam on the day in which he should touch the fruit, when he long deferred the punishment. For then was Adam consigned to death, and death began its reign in him, until supervening grace should bring a remedy. So mm. I'm reminded of Paul's statement in Ephesians 2, where he says that we are walking in death yeah. until yeah. we are in Christ. Because there's a break in, in that uh, communion in what he wants. If we're not reconciled to God yet, then we're dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to Kidner and Von Rad about the, uh, the nature of the fall. The fall happens here, not when man is dead physically. Okay. So Kidner says, as R. Martin Ashard has put it, before the fall, between Adam and death, which is part of his natural lot as an element in his human heritage, there stands the living God. His presence is sufficient to ward death off. And that's the end of uh, Martin Archard's quote. The translation of Enoch, that he should not see death, perhaps illustrates what God had prepared for man. And then Von Rad says, how simple and sober is our narrative compared to the sensual myths of the nations in letting the meaning of life in paradise consist completely in the question of obedience to God and not in pleasure and freedom from suffering, etc. That's a very big point. For the Muslim paradise, as well as the JW paradise, paradise is a very carnal place. It's a pleasure dome. Yeah. And God is not there, and even the Muslims don't have a vision of, of God being uh, a relationship with you, a direct relationship with you. It's always mm -hmm. mediated. Mm -hmm. So we know as JWs that's the case for us. So what is it that, that we have done with death, i.e., uh, what's the definition that is so uh, deleterious to our understanding of, of this very plain case in the book of Genesis that yeah. the it's, thing that's missing from from parad the thing that's missing from from our life as soon as we're expelled from paradise is God yeah as, as Kidner says here uh, or quoting Martin Ashard his presence is sufficient to ward death off yeah and yeah. of course Moses proved that did he not on on yeah. the mountain yeah that's what keeps us alive in the full sense is is having having communion with God, having relationship with God. So then what is death? And Donald Barnhouse defines it this way, the death of the body is the separation of soul and spirit from the body. The death of soul and spirit is their separation from God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So death occurs in several stages, the last of which is, is physical death. Mm -hmm. And then of course in the book of Revelation you have a second death, which is eternal separation from God. So we'll put in a couple of links to uh, a study we did way back on Genesis 2 itself. What are life and death in Genesis chapter 2 and also to that playlist because that was the first video in a playlist. What JW Org is not telling you about life and death.